Adulthood is a time when, along with family, career and work are the most important things. Adulthood is also a time when people can take on greater responsibilities and control over their lives. Adults generally go through the sixth and seventh stages of psychosocial development. Intimacy versus isolation is the sixth stage. During this period, uh, the major conflict centers on forming intimate, loving relationships with other people. During this period, we begin to share ourselves more intimately with others. We explore relationships leading toward longer-term commitments with someone other than a family member. Successful completion of this stage can result in happy relationships and a sense of commitment, safety, and care within a relationship. Generativity versus stagnation is the seventh of uh, Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. This stage takes place usually during middle adulthood, ages 40 to 65 years. The uh, main sections of uh, this lecture are personality development in adulthood, considering uh, how Erickson, Maslow, and uh, the big five personality traits help us understand personality development. Then the next two sections look at intimacy, connecting with others, and generativity, the work of adulthood. Erickson's stages help us understand personality development in adulthood. Originally, he envisioned eight stages of development, which occur in sequence from birth through old age. Three of his stages cover the years after adolescence. The adult stages are less age-based. Later in his life, Erickson stressed that stages and ages do not occur in lockstep. Erickson's stages do not always appear in sequence, and the adolescent stage can last longer, past the teenage years. Based on Erickson's ideas, psychology has reconceptualized the way the later periods of life are viewed. Middle and late adulthood are no longer viewed as irrelevant. Because of Erickson, they are now considered active and significant times of personal growth. Erickson's theory has good face validity, uh, many people find they can relate to his theories about various stages of life through their own experiences. Since development across the lifespan is uh, variable, four of Erickson's stages could be considered relevant to adulthood. First, identity versus role confusion. Although Erickson originally situated the identity crisis during adolescence, he realized that identity concerns could be lifelong. Identity combines values and traditions from childhood within the current social context. Since contexts keep evolving, uh, many adults reassess all four types of identity. Next, intimacy versus isolation. Adults seek intimacy, a close reciprocal connection with another human being. Intimacy is mutual, not self-absorbed which means that adults need to devote time and energy to one another. Isolation is especially likely when divorce or death disrupts established intimate relationships. Next, generativity versus stagnation. Adults need to care for the next generation, either by raising their own children or by mentoring, teaching, and helping others. Erickson's first description of this stage focused on parenthood, but later he included other ways to achieve generativity. And finally, integrity versus despair. When Erickson himself reached his 70s, he decided that integrity with the goal of combating prejudice and helping all humanity was too important to be left to the elderly. He also thought that each person's entire life could be directed toward connecting a personal journey uh, with the uh, historical and cultural purpose of human society, which is the ultimate achievement of integrity. One of the strengths of Erickson's theory is its ability to tie together important psychosocial development across the entire lifespan. Abraham Maslow also provided important insights into personality development in adulthood. Maslow described five sequential stages Movement occurs when people have satisfied their needs at one level and are ready for the next step. 
In his later years, Maslow reassessed his final level, self-actualization, suggesting another level after that called self-transcendence. Maslow became ill and soon died after conceiving of this new pinnacle, which is why we hear little about it today. Part of the problem that Maslow and others had with the idea of self-actualization was that it was directed entirely on the individual. Self-actualized people become what they are individually capable of being. But scholars have argued that this excludes a concern for others. Thus, human beings may feel a strong need to become all that they can be, uh, but once this need is met, uh, some continue to feel needs beyond the self to pursue goals that may in fact have little to do with the self at all. It's likely you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs from a, a previous uh, psychology class. At the bottom are physiological needs and moving up we get to the uh, safety needs, uh, in other words feeling protected and defended. Uh, then uh, the third uh, step is love and belongingness. Uh, followed by esteem and then self-actualization at the top and then self-transcendence uh, was considered by Maslow as uh, possibly being on top of that. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy is, is kind of like a ladder. Once a person stands firmly on a higher rung, the lower rungs are no longer needed. The someone who is uh, someone who has arrived at step four uh, might devalue safety step two, and be willing to risk personal safety to gain respect. Another perspective on personality development involves the big five. Today, many researchers believe there are five core personality traits. Longitudinal studies suggest that these big five personality traits tend to be relatively stable over the course of adulthood. Longitudinal, cross-sectional, and multicultural research has identified five clusters of personality traits that appear in every culture and era. The big five arranged on this slide so that their first letters spell the word ocean as a uh, memory aid correlate with almost every aspect of adulthood. Openness refers to uh, being imaginative, uh, curious, artistic, creative, and open to new experiences. Conscientiousness refers to being organized, deliberate, conforming, and self-disciplined. Extroversion refers to being outgoing, assertive, and active. Agreeableness refers to being kind, helpful, easygoing, and generous. And neuroticism refers to being anxious, moody, self-punishing, and critical. Actions and attitudes have been linked to the Big Five. For example, education. Conscientious people are more likely to complete college. Cheating on exams usually involves individuals low on agreeableness. Marriage. Extroverts more often marry. Divorce is more likely for neurotics. IQ is related to being higher in openness. Verbal fluency is related to openness and extroversion. And political views have also been linked to the uh, Big Five. Conservatives are less open. With age, personality generally undergoes a slight positive shift. People move from changing the environment to fit self to changing self to fit the environment. A study of well-being and self-esteem in 28 nations found that people are generally happiest if their personality traits match the norms of their social context. Personality change, if it ever is to occur, is more likely early or later in life, not in the middle. Do individual personality traits originate in the brain? Interesting question. This hypothesis was tested by scientists who sought to find correlations between brain activity, shown here in red, and personality traits. People who rated themselves high in uh, four of the big five, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, but not openness, also had more activity in brain regions that are known to relate to those traits. Here are two side views on the left and a top and bottom view on the right of brains of people high in neuroticism. 
the brain regions known to be especially sensitive to stress, depression, threat, and punishment. The yellow bullseyes were more active than in the same brain regions in people low in neuroticism. The next section looks at intimacy, connecting with others. Intimacy varies by culture, age, and personality. And this is important, intimacy needs are lifelong. Adults meet their need for social connection through their relationships with relatives, friends, co-workers, and romantic partners. It is important to understand that intimacy and sex aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, often people wind up using the terms intimacy and sex interchangeably. This isn't quite accurate, as it is possible to be intimate without being sexual. Conversely, you can have a great sexual relationship with your partner without being intimate. Intimacy is about being open with your partner and not being afraid to be vulnerable. Some people love each other very deeply but still have trouble connecting on an intimate level. This can be due, for example, to uh, one person in a marriage having problems with letting other people too close. Some people choose marriage to commit to a romantic partner. However, in every culture, marriage is less common than it used to be. It is more desirable in theory uh, than in practice. And you can see from the data from uh, this survey that uh, the percentage of U.S. adults who married uh, has decreased. Besides marriage, there are other forms of romantic partnership. One is cohabitation. And this varies in the plans and prospects people have for it. It is the preference for many people. More couples are living together than ever before. But the reasons men give for cohabiting and the concerns they express about it differ markedly from women's. A University of Michigan study found both men and women saw cohabitation as a temporary state in which to gauge compatibility but major gender differences emerged in the underlying goals of living together. Women saw it as a transitional arrangement preceding marriage, while men tended to see it as a convenient, low-risk way to see if a relationship had longer-term potential, using terms like test drive to describe the arrangement. Another form is living apart together. This involves a steady romantic partner uh, and they have separate residences and activities. Uh, they are sexually faithful. Uh, however, they may struggle with financial aspects of the relationship. Marriage, cohabitation, and living apart together show us that adults everywhere seek committed sexual partnerships. Partners help meet their needs for intimacy, as well as to uh, raise children, share resources, and provide care when needed. Married people are a little happier, healthier, and richer than never married ones, but not by much. Of course, romantic partners are in love. However, there are different kinds of love. Robert Sternberg's triangular theory of love holds that love can be understood in terms of three components that together can be viewed as forming the vertices of a triangle. These three components are intimacy, passion, and commitment. Each component manifests a different aspect of love. When all three aspects are evident, consummate or complete love occurs. I have a theory of love called the triangular theory of love. And the basic idea is that love has three components. The first is intimacy, which is how well you communicate with the person you love, how close you feel to them, how much you trust them, how much they trust you, how connected you feel in general. The second component is passion, uh, and that's just how much longing you feel. It's uh, sort of like I can't be without the person, I just think about them all the time. And the third component is commitment, and that is that you've decided you're really in this relationship for keeps. It's really important to you. And the basic idea of the theory is that different combinations of these components give you different kinds of love. So, for example, uh, if you were to have intimacy plus passion, that would be romantic love. Uh, if you were to have intimacy plus commitment, it would be what I call companionate love. It's more like a good long-term friendship. If you had passion, 
plus commitment without intimacy, it would be foolish love because you're committing yourself on the basis of feeling really excited about someone without even getting to know them. And if you have all three, I call it complete. Of the three aspects of love, commitment is the most crucial and correlates with lifelong health and happiness. The passage of time, age, ethnicity, personality, education, and circumstances also influence love. Couples increasingly link their lives over time. Friends and acquaintances are also important in this developmental period. Everyone is part of a social convoy, a group of people who age together and provide a protective layer of social relations throughout life. They can include family members, friends, and mere acquaintances. When family bonds are similar to friendship bonds, relatives are the mainstays of the social convoy. The phrase social convoy was coined back in 1980. With our growing awareness of the importance of connection and the risks of loneliness, the social convoy is a concept worth keeping in mind uh, because you can't build a convoy late in life. You have to pay attention to who's traveling with you along the way if you want any of them to be there when you need them. Uh, the critical point about social convoys is that they set out together. They don't just meet up at the end of the journey. When you are later in life and something happens, you become very ill, say, uh, you can't build a new social convoy. You need to rely at that moment on the convoy you already have. Friends and acquaintances are typically the most crucial members of the social convoy. They are often able to provide practical help and useful advice when serious problems, uh, the death of a family member, personal illness, or loss of a job, arise. Friendships tend to improve with age. Convoys are meant to provide protection. Uh, you might think of camels traveling through the desert, long-haul truckers, or Navy ships banding together to ward off enemy submarines. But the concept can apply to people too. Uh, your social convoy is the core set of supportive relationships, close friends and family that move with you through life. Friends over the years are chosen for mutual loyalty and aid. They provide practical help and advice and friendships tend to improve over time. Uh, they aid in physical and uh, mental health, and friends provide encouragement in most aspects of life. Universally, humans are healthier with social support and sicker when socially isolated. Our family bonds may include fictive kin. This includes people who have become accepted as part of a family who have no genetic or legal relationship to that family. A fictive kin may become important when blood relatives become toxic and they can provide a lifeline for adults rejected by their original family. Fictive kin is defined as kinship that does not involve relations by blood or law and encompasses all of the benefits of kinship without any genetic ties. Examples of fictive kin would be close friends or that uncle that isn't actually your uncle because he's just your dad's best friend, but you still say, hey, uncle, whenever you see him. Now, I know the word fictive sounds a lot like fiction, and uh, thus we relate it to being not real or fake, and that sounds negative, but that's not the case. The whole idea behind fictive kin is, yes, we are not technically related to these people, but we have created such an intense, real connection with them that it feels like we are. They are like family to us. The last section of the uh, lecture is generativity, the work of adulthood. Erickson said after the stage of intimacy versus isolation comes generativity versus stagnation. When adults seek to be productive in a caring way, adults satisfy their need to be generative in many ways, including creativity, caregiving, and employment. Generativity refers to making your mark on the world through creating or nurturing things that will outlast the individual. People experience a need to create or nurture things, uh, often having uh, mentees or creating positive changes that will benefit other people. Parenthood is one way that uh, generativity needs can be met. 
the chief form of generativity is establishing and guiding the next generation. Every parent is tested and transformed by the dynamic experience of raising children. Just when an adult thinks he or she has mastered the art of parenting, the child advances to the next stage and the adult is required to make major adjustments. Caregiving is a form of generativity. Uh, some caregiving involves meeting another person's physical needs, but much of it has to do with fulfilling another person's psychological needs. A kinkeeper is a caregiver who takes responsibility for maintaining communications among family members. Raising a child is perhaps the most stressful family life experience. The parent's intimacy needs may be postponed and adjustments are made, and it seems like constantly. Children affect their parents through their personalities, needs, and sheer existence. Research found that compared to non-parents, parents tend to experience more highs, but also more lows. The challenges and struggles inherent in parenting, uh, a baby crying all night, the emergency room visit for stitches or a broken bone, uh, may be balanced by the highs of parenthood, such as holding a sleeping infant or watching your child hit the winning home run. Compared to non-parents, those with children have higher highs, uh, but they also have more joy in their lives, uh, along with more stress and negative emotions as well. Adoptive parents also have uh, their own concerns, but adoptive parents have uh, some advantages. They are legally connected to their children for life, and they desperately wanted the child. Strong bonds can develop, especially when uh, the children are adopted as infants. Current adoptions are usually open. Open adoption is a form of adoption in which the biological and adoptive families have access to varying degrees of each other's personal information and have an option of contact. Some open adoptions are more open than others. Some of these include adoption relationships where, uh, with uh, personal visits agreed upon by both the adoptive family and birth parents. Other open adoptions may just include periodic phone calls on holidays or birthdays. Reactive attachment disorder may occur. Adopting a child does come with challenges as the uh, child must adapt to his or her new home, new family, or even new country. The majority of adoptive children have very positive results and grow up to be happy and successful people. Attachment refers to the physical, psychological, and even biological bond that occurs between a child and their primary caretakers. Uh, for many adopted children, their attachment bond is broken, sometimes multiple times as they are passed around foster care and finally settle into their permanent adoptive family. In reactive attachment disorder, the child often shows inconsistent emotional withdrawal toward caregivers. Specifically, he or she minimally responds or seeks comfort when emotionally distressed. There is a limited positive affect and episodes of unexplained irritability, sadness, or emotional turmoil. Another type of parenthood involves step parents. Positive merging and attachment are not always forthcoming. Stepchildren also offer unexpected stresses to a marriage. Research shows that it is completely normal for a step family to take several years to truly establish trust and bonds. This is even more true when the children involved are older. After five years, step families are more stable than first marriage families because second marriages are happier than first marriages. Step families experience most of their troubles in the first two years. Contrary to myth, step families have a high rate of success in raising healthy children. 80% of the kids come out fine. From the standpoint of the kids, yes, they feel lost going into a step family. It certifies that their original family exists no more and it takes time to adjust to a new set of people in new family roles. Foster parenting is the most difficult form of parenting, partly because of the emotional and behavioral needs of children. Intense involvement is often required, and the child movement between foster homes makes generative attachment difficult. 
for grandparents, grandparenting uh, provides new opportunities for generativity, and most grandparents enjoy their role. In addition to parenting, employment allows adults to meet generativity needs by allowing people to complete many tasks. They can uh, develop and use their personal skills, express their creative energy, aid and advise coworkers as a mentor or friend, support the education and health of uh, their families through their financial contributions, and contribute to the community by providing goods or services. Employment provides extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards of work are the tangible benefits, usually in the form of compensation, and they tend to be more important when people are young. The intrinsic rewards include the intangible gratifications. Uh, intrinsic rewards, such as a good working environment, predict worker satisfaction, worker effort, and less burnout. Older workers are more likely to experience autonomy and mentor younger workers, which is an intrinsic reward. Absolute income refers to how much one makes in a year, 30000 uh, 50000 or even $100,000. Now, this matters less for job satisfaction than how a person's income compares with others in their profession or neighborhood or how it compares to their own salary in the past. And salary cuts have emotional as well as financial effects. In adulthood, unemployment can have some serious effects, more stress over the long term than a divorce or bereavement. It's also destructive to physical and mental health. Psychological needs are unmet. There's a high rate of domestic and substance abuse, depression, and other mental health problems among the unemployed. The employment landscape has been changing. There is increasing diversity among workers. A change from a primarily white male civilian workforce and military to greater diversity of workers in all areas. The U.S. labor force is increasingly non-white, according to uh, Labor Department statistics. Uh, the next challenge is for women and people of all ethnic groups to become more proportionally distributed in various vocations, management positions, and workplaces. An aspect of employment that is of concern to developmentalists involves changing schedules. The standard 9 to 5 schedule is increasingly unusual. An average of one-third U.S. workers have non-standard jobs. Non-standard shifts may cause stress for families and parents. It has long been uh, recognized that varied schedules upset the body rhythms of adults, making them more vulnerable to physical illness as well as emotional problems. Beyond health, the impact on family life is a major concern for developmentalists. Those who are most likely to have uh, mandatory non-standard schedules are parents of young children who are most likely to suffer. Part-time work and self-employment do not offer a, always offer a means to a balance life demands. The challenge is to find a balance that works for you.